Sanjeev's wife, of Chris, she has a bad fever. She was in the hospital for a while. And uh, there's mosquito season there. And so uh, those mosquitoes are pretty pretty bad, pretty potent. And, uh, she had a 105 fever. Uh, Sajeev had it two weeks ago. He was in the hospital. And now he was all, all set. Now his wife is just got out of the hospital. She's doing better. So keep her in your prayers. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Keep in prayer also the uh, Brew family up in, they're up in Portugal and Spain. Keep them in your prayers. And, um, keep Brother Bob Lewis in prayers. He's put out several resumes that he would get a job down in Florida. And uh, let's see, that's about it, I think. And Priscilla, of course. That's that's a gift. And, um, you know, I believe that Priscilla is such a godly example of what a woman of God should be. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord. Well, if you have your Bibles, open them up. This is Bible study night. It's Wednesday night. Uh, Acts chapter 26. We'll be starting with verse 1 tonight. And... Uh, Praise God, Brother Diamond's doing well. His both, he had both his knees done at the same time. It's crazy. Two knee replacements at the same time. And then a doctor said uh, after 16 days after the operation, it is amazing how he's progressed. So he's doing all his exercises. He's doing his therapy. He's doing everything that needs to be done. Imagine that doing done, two at the same time. If he's listening, if you're listening, Brother David, you're done. I'll tell you, he's got to, he had to walk with a walker and everything. Diane, I talked to Diane tonight. She said, I can't wait for him to get out of the house. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, open up to chapter 26, please. We'll be starting with verse 1 tonight. Let's just pray that God will touch those who are listening. Amen. Because my words don't mean a thing. It's only God's word and His Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, we need more preachers like that. You know, we may not have a big church, but I want to tell you one thing right now. we got the Holy Ghost. And I'd rather have the Holy Ghost with a few than, the, than a whole lot of people without the Holy Ghost. Amen. Praise the Lord. I mean, it'd be nice to have a big church and the Holy Ghost, but you know, we just wait and see what God has for us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Starting with verse 1 tonight. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Now understand one thing. Even though the Apostle Paul was great in authority, even though he was an apostle, even though he had great respect given to him, he still was a man under authority. And Agrippa was the king, and so he would wait for permission to speak. We don't see that today. <laughs> We see a lot of people today just open up their mouth and everything spews out of it, you know. But those in authority, such as pastors and uh, apostles and evangelists and prophets and all that, we take them for granted and we just uh, rail on them with our lips. Let me tell you something. You, what you sow, you reap. And so be careful when whatever you say against a man of God. Amen? Because it will come back on you, believe me. I'm not saying if he's not doing anything wrong, that's different. But He said, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. He said, I think, now he's going he's to kind of go over the same things we've been talking about in the previous chapter, so don't get too bored and don't fall asleep on me. Okay? But um, he's kind of reiterating what he was saying before. He's giving his testimony. And I want to say for a moment, don't ever undervalue your testimony. Your testimony in Christ means a lot. It means that God has taken you and translated you out of the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light. So many people in the world are hurting right now. So many people are in darkness, and great is that darkness. You can see it in their eyes, you can see it in their face, you can see it in their expressions of how they handle things and how they do things. I heard a statistic today, and I was shocked when I heard the statistic on the radio. Just this past weekend, just this past weekend, there were 100 shootings in, in Chicago and 13 deaths. 13 people, uh, 100 people were injured and 13 deaths in one weekend in Chicago, and they have the toughest gun laws 
in the union. Oh, one of the tough. Uh, California is the next toughest, I believe. It was kind of close. People are going nuts. People are going crazy. Uh, the, you know, and I just want to say this one thing, if I can. All these negative people about Trump, you need to stop it. All the news media is there. You need to stop it. Stop with all this negativity, and let's pull together and make this country great again. You know, forget if you're not a Democrat or a Republican. I didn't like Obama. I didn't vote for Obama. Didn't want nothing to do with Obama, but he was my president. And I had to suffer with it. You don't see me tipping over cars, burning things, uh, you know, throwing things at police cars, burning police cars, burning building down, breaking glass. Come on. Act your age. Amen. Anybody watching by Facebook, if you're offended by this, oh well. Get over it. Problem is we got too many snowflakes. Not enough uh, solid people anymore. You know, that have, can be difference of opinion, but yet still be friends. Amen. So here, P, here Paul is now uh, going to defend himself. He says, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. These are his own people. These are the very people that he once worked for, worshipped with, lived among, taught among. These are the very people of his own nation. And now they're the ones that are bringing accusation against him because they're afraid of, of losing their religion. He says, especially because I honor thee, or I says, because I know thee to be expert in all the customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Now, when a preacher says to listen patiently, that means he's got a lot to say. Amen. Hallelujah. And so uh, here he goes, and he says, My manner of life from my youth. We don't see that today. We don't see youth serving God anymore. We see youth wanting to serve fun. Fun is their God. Playing is their God. God is not in the picture. They want to have fun with their friends. They want to go out with their friends. God is not in the picture. They don't want to know about God. They don't want to learn about God. They want to have fun. But Paul says, from a youth, from his youth, listen to this, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. They all know me, he says, from my youth, growing up, my manner of life, from my youth, which was first among my own nation at Jerusalem, knowing all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Now, a Pharisee was one that was set apart, one that was dedicated for the law, dedicated for the Talmud, for the Torah, set aside specifically for God, to serve God in Judaism. He was a Pharisee. It was a great honor to be called a Pharisee. Now, we saw Jesus. He abraded the Pharisees, and he openly showed their hypocrisy, but they were good Pharisees. They were those that really loved God, and they really wanted God, but they missed it. And they missed it because God blinded their eyes. That's what the Bible says. The Jews were blinded so that the Gentiles could be grafted in. And so now, God is removing the blinders from the Jews, and many of the Jews are becoming saved, getting Recognizing Jesus as Messiah. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. 
What was that promise? Anybody know what that promise was? Nope. Listen, I'll read it again. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Who is the fathers of the Jews? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What did God promise Abraham? He says what? I'm going to bless you and bless your seed. And it shall be like the numerous sands of the earth and of the stars. So I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your seed. And out of thee shall come a seed. And all the all nation and all the earth shall be blessed. And that word seed is singular, not plural. So through the lineage of the fathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the nation of Israel, out of that nation will come a son. His name shall be called Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He has filled the prophetic utterances of the prophets of old. And this is what Paul is saying here. He says, I'm being judged now for the hope of the promise made of God unto the fathers. Unto which promises our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. They had a hope. Remember, Abraham looked to the cross, and it was counted him righteousness by faith, right? He looked forward to the promise. And he was made righteous because of the promise. He believed the promise. Amen? He says, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? One of the arguments was, well, yeah, Jesus lived and he couldn't have been a Messiah because he was killed. And you know, there was many theories of why some people didn't believe in the resurrection. They believe his body was stolen by the disciples. You know, uh, someone you know, hid his body or I wasn't really dead, and he went off, and he lived somewhere else. So there was different theories that went on. But can I tell you, I know that he's risen because I went to his grave, and he's not there. I went to Israel, and I went to the place they believed that was his grave. and He's not there. Not only that, but he was seen of over 500 people alive. And they saw him ascend up to heaven in the book of Acts in the beginning. You remember we read, we read about that, studied it. And the two angels came and sat at his tomb. And they said, uh, at the Mount of Olives, and said, Why are you standing here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus. Not another one. He's not coming to New York. He's not coming to California. He's not coming to uh, um, the Philippines. He's not coming to Japan. He's not coming to China. He's not coming to Russia. This same Jesus. And it's so amazing because Linda and I, we were standing on the Mount of Olives. We were right there where he ascended on that mountain where the people were looking up at the place where he ascended. And he says, this same Jesus as you have seen him go shall so come in like manner. He said, Verily I th thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now he's testifying and saying, Look, I used to persecute this sect. I used to persecute this way. I used to be against this way. He says, Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up into prison, having received authority from the chief 
He said, I worked with them against this thing. I was against this thing. And when they were, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. He said, I had put Christians to death. So something happened. Something, not a religious experience, but something happened, a transformation, something a glorious happened to the Apostle Paul. He said, I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and bring exceedingly and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto the strange cities. He said, I went all over the place looking for these Christians, what they're called Christians, and I would persecute them, and I would belittle them, and I would ridicule them. That spirit's still alive today. A lot of people make fun of Christians. They ridicule and they mock Christians. It's the same spirit that's there. That was back in Paul's day. It's still alive today. There are always going to be people that don't believe. But I want to tell you one thing. There's going to come a day when they're going to wish they had. He said, Wherefore, whereupon as I went to Damascus with, with authority and commission from the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the ground, when, if, when we get the first account of that, you don't get all of them fell to the ground. But every single one of them fell to the ground. Something happened to them. Remember it says they saw the light, but they didn't hear the voice? They had fallen to the earth. He said, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue. Do you know that God speaks all languages? He does. He speaks Brazilian, he speaks Portuguese, he speaks French, he speaks English, he speaks Hebrew, he speaks Aramaic, he speaks Nigerian, Filipino, Russia, Russian. He speaks all the languages. And he spoke to Paul in the Hebrew tongue and he said, Saul, Saul. Remember that was his name before he changed his name to Paul. He said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? How did Paul persecute Jesus? How did he persecute Jesus? Jesus was already ascended up to heaven. How did he persecute Jesus? Because he persecuted the church. When you come against the church of Jesus Christ, you're coming against him. He said, if you, Jesus said these words in the gospel. He said, if you've done it to the least of these, you have done it as unto me. Wow. And I said to him, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Did Jesus condemn him? No. Did Jesus upbraid him for what he did? No. What did he tell him? He said, but arise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Don't believe all these people that say they had an encounter with Jesus, that he appeared in their room and all this other baloney. Don't believe it unless there's a purpose. When they tell you, oh, we were in church and gold dust fell down and feathers came down, I always ask the question, 
What was the purpose of that? What's the purpose? God always does something and manifests himself with a purpose. I appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister, a servant, a servant, and what? A witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things which I will appear unto thee. Wow. Now he's going to give the mandate of what that purpose is. He's going to be a minister. He's going to be a witness. But he's also going to explain exactly what Paul's ministry will be. Look what he says. To open, uh, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Now he has a divine call from God. God appears, Jesus appears to him, tells him, what are you doing? You're fighting against me. For I have a purpose for this visitation. I have called you to be a minister. I have called you to be a witness of these things which you have seen and the things that I will reveal unto you. And then he says, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I will send thee. So Paul's main ministry would be to the Gentiles. I sometimes am amazed how people in the church today, especially in leadership, because of the Christian psychology that's permeated many Christian circles. And they say, if you have not gone through what a person has gone through, you can't minister to them. That is a lie from the pit of hell. You can never understand what a person's gone through unless you've gone through what they've gone through. Not true. It doesn't matter what I've gone through. But I know what Jesus went through. Paul was a Pharisee. He, he was separated. He separated himself from the things of the world and the impurities of the world and impure foods. He was kosher. Knew the letter of the law. Was a PhD scholar in the things of Hebrewism and Jewish theology, yet God sends him with all of his expertise of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin, takes him and sends him to the ignorant Gentile who knows nothing about the law. They were steeped in heathenism, steeped in idolatry. Then he takes Peter, who is a fisherman. If I can compare the two, it would be like one that has just graduated with a PhD from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary up in Massachusetts. And going down to New Bedford docks here and getting a fisherman, a drunkard, a drug addict, touching his life, revealing supernaturally Jesus Christ. And he gets saved. And God calls him and says, I'm sending you to the Jews. Because it doesn't go according to our knowledge. 
It doesn't go according to what we know, but who we know. That's why God's ways are not our ways. We think if we have the best educated uh, men that we can send them to the educated. No. Send an ignorant person. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Anointed and called by God in that ministry. His wisdom will far surpass any wisdom of any man with the highest degree. So don't ever feel inferior. Whatever God calls you to, the Bible says he equips. So here the Apostle Paul is sent to the Gentiles. That must have been kind of a shock to him. You're going to send me to the Gentiles? I'm more qualified for the Jews. But then you read in Paul's letter, Philippians. After he began to understand and know that the revelation that God would give him, he says, I count all things as dumb. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, I call it all as refuge. Dung. We all know what dung is, right? Think of it. All of his education, all of his experience, he counted it as dumb. Compared to the knowledge of Christ. How did he get this knowledge? Did he go to Bible school? No. Did he have a master's degree in theology? No. He got this through intimate relationship with Christ. And Jesus poured out upon the Apostle Paul. The inspiration, the revelation to impart to us, you and I, today we're standing here with the very letters that Paul had written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to, in, to give us doctrine, to give us theology, so that we may grow up in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Still, 2,000 some odd years later, the Apostle Paul still speaking to the Gentiles. To the Gentiles. Every time you hear one of the letters of Paul preached on television, on radio, he's still reaching the Gentiles. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now here's the purpose of the call. We have the divine call. We have the reason for the call to be a servant and a witness. But now here's the hands-on. Here's what he wants him to do. Verse 18. To open their eyes. Wait a minute, you mean everybody walked around with their eyes closed? No, not talking about the physical eyes, but the spiritual eyes. So that's telling me that if he's called to open their eyes, then they must be blind. They must be in darkness. They cannot see clearly, or they can't see at all. So the Gentiles could not see at all. Their eyes were closed. He's calling them to open them. They must be closed. How is he going to do that? He wrote it in another place. The God of this world has blinded their eyes. Lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine on. Number one, to open their eyes. Number two, to turn them from darkness to light. That's the call 
If I can say that's the call and the mandate of the church. To open their eyes. To turn them from darkness to light. That's why we're broadcasting on Facebook. That those that may be watching may tune in. Their eyes may be open. That they will turn from the darkness to the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. We are to point them to Jesus. But he also said this, the third thing. And from the power of Satan. The Gentiles unsaved, whether we like it or not, are under the power of Satan. What is happening against our president and the vehement and the hatred and the fury and all of the derogatory statements that are being made are all from the darkness. Never in the history has it ever been so ugly. Well, they'll lie. And we know that Satan is the father of lies. They'll tell falsehood and make it seem truthful. And they learned all of this through Hitler. When Hitler invaded Germany, he didn't go in and just take over. He started with philosophy. And if he said this. He says, a way to conquer your, the citizens is to take away their guns. What the Democrats want to do? They want to take away our guns. He said, if you say something loud enough and long enough, people will believe it. You say it often enough and loud enough, after a while, people will believe it. To turn them from the power of Satan. The Bible says the whole world lieth under the wicked one in Revelation. The whole world is deceived. All the false religions are satanically induced to get them and keep them from the one true God, which is Jesus Christ. The way, the truth, and the life. Every false religion, every atheistic thought and philosophy and ideology from the colleges is to submit to the diabolical authority and power of Satan. They say, well, you can't tell me that Jesus is the only way. There are many ways to God. That philosophy and ideology is demonic. Why can't there be just one way? Because man will not be satisfied with just one way. We live in a world where we have multiple choices of everything. And we're used to choosing everything. We choose what grocery store to go to. We don't like that grocery store, we go to another one. What church to go to? If we don't like that church, we go to another one. That's like the story I heard of the man who was caught on a deserted island. His boat had sunk and he had swam and he saw a, a hung on a piece of wood and he drifted for about three, four days and he came to a de deserted island. He was on that island. He was hoping to get rescued. You know, we'd start fires and things and nothing happened the first year, second year. So he decided, well... No, he says, uh, I got to live like I'm going to live here the rest of my life. So he said, I might as well build a church. So he built a church out of, you know, the bamboo and stuff, a nice church with a roof on it and everything. And he lived there for five to six to seven years. And finally a ship was going by. He lit a fire and the ship saw him and sent a boat for him. 
So they got on the land. They asked him, how long have you been here? He said, I've been here seven years. He said, well, how did you live? And he says, come on, I'll show you. I will take you to a, through the island. He took him, it was in a big island. He went to the island. He said, this is where I live. And he said, um, uh, this is my church that I used to go to. And he built another church over here. Yet he was all alone. To take them from the kingdom of darkness to his marvelous light takes the gospel. The only one true gospel. You can't preach any other gospel. How many know there's another Jesus and another gospel? Paul said, if any man come preaching any other Jesus, if you receive us another spirit or another gospel, let him be anathema, accursed. There is no other gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, it is the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob promised many, many, many years ago would happen. And would come into Israel riding on a donkey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as to many as received him, to them he gave power to become the children of God. To release them from the power of Satan unto God. That they may what? Receive. Forgiveness of sins. And receive forgiveness of sins. And inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Not only will they receive the forgiveness, but they'll also become sanctified. They will stop making the right choices now because they're in the light, not in the dark. And as they read the Bible, the more they read the Bible, the more things will come to light. And the more things come to light, you want to admit that the things that you're in darkness to, you need to repent of. And you turn away from darkness, and you start walking toward the light. Jesus said, if we say that we have fellowship with him, and obey not his commandments, we lie and do not the truth. Read 1 John. Read 2 John, 3 John. It's all about that. Those that are of the devil, those that are of Christ. I can't believe it's 5 past 8 already. Verse 19, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Thank God. Thank God the Apostle Paul was, 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 was not disobedient to that call. So many people have been called by God and are disobedient. They're not following the call of God. So many are called to salvation. So many have heard the gospel message and they're staying in disobedience to the heavenly vision, to the heavenly call. What was the Revelation that Jesus gave to his disciples. Who do men say that I am? What was their response? Some say Elijah. Some say John the Baptist. He said, well, who do you say that I am? Now watch this now. Then Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. And Jesus said to him, Simon by Jonah, I'm so glad you went to the university. I'm so glad that you got your master's degree in theology. I'm so glad that you got that revelation from the hours of hours of study in the Greek, the Hebrew and Aramaic. I'm so glad you studied church history. I'm so glad that you studied the systematic theology which brought you to this place of final knowledge. No, he didn't say that. He said, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you. 
But my heavenly Father, He has revealed that unto you. Our Father God is the great revealer of truth. And when you examine truth, you'll see people do one of two things. They'll try to rationalize the truth away. Or they simply say, well, I don't believe that. With no factual information. They do that all the time. They try to rationalize the scripture. They try to figure it out in their own little pea brains. You know, how many, how many of us know we all have pea brains? About the size of a pea. That's about as big as they are. When it comes to the knowledge and the foreknowledge and the predestined knowledge of God. We're, we only know very minuscule this much. Is the things of the Bible for today? Absolutely. Absolutely. The Bible isn't in question. It's the philosophy and ideology of those who are afraid to open up the, their hearts to the truth of the gospel, to the, the scriptures that are so blind. Why do we have so many denominations? Why do we have so many that believe one thing here, another thing here? And they say, well, it's not clear. Yes, it is. I'm a firm believer. I'm sorry. I believe with all of my heart the Holy Spirit never intended to cause confusion. What he has written, he has written. What he has meant, he has meant. What he wanted us to know is in this Bible. He wouldn't give us the Bible and the truths of the Bible so that not so that we cannot know them. Why would he have it all written down if he knew we would not understand it? But the prejudice of our theological seminaries and the slanting of their view is what people learn, and they take that view as gospel truth. And they don't examine the scriptures. But when you examine the scriptures with them, they fall apart. When you show them in the scripture, this is still happening today. Fall apart. Oh well, so if that's the case, then salvation was two thousand years ago. We don't have to be saved anymore. We're all under grace. See, that's where the that's where a lot of heresy comes in. We're under grace, so we don't need to confess our sin anymore. God forgives it all. We're under grace. We're under the atonement. We've said our sin is prayer. We're saved, so therefore we don't need to confess our sins no more because we're under grace. And that covers it. Then we don't need the Bible no more. We don't need to go to church no more. We don't need to read no more. We can live our life the way we want to live. And because we're saved and we're saved by grace, and once saved, always saved, you know, we're all set. That's one of the biggest lies. He said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. Oh, see? Where are the gospel preachers to stand behind the American pulpits and call people to repentance? This was the early message of the gospel. Today, oh, we don't want to say anything because we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want anybody to leave the church. You know, we don't want anybody to, to go. Listen, the gospel is a gospel. I want to preach what Jesus preached. Jesus' first message was, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He even said in one place in Scripture, repent or perish. He said he showed them that they should repent and turn to God. Repent of what? You can't mention sin in church today. People get offended.
repent of sin and turn to God. And do works meet for repentance. What that means is you don't do works to get repentance. You do the works because you have repentance. In other words, once you repent, the works that you're going to show of that repentance is that you're not going to do it anymore. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let me, let's reverse it back. One, two, three. He says, For this cause the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having there obtained the help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both to the small and great, saying, Another thing than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Verse 23 That Christ should suffer that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Now he's accusing him of learning too much, studying too much. But Paul said, he says, what I learned, I didn't learn from the apostles. I didn't learn this. He says, what I learned was from divine revelation of God. Amen. So now we don't sit waiting for divine revelation. What we do is we say, Lord, now we have the revelation in the Bible. All we need is inspiration. Show me what that means. He said, because of your much learning, Paul, you are crazy. You're crazy. Something's wrong with you, Paul. Where is this kind of preaching in America? Where is this kind of preaching in the churches in America? No, we're, we're, we're more worried about our programs. We're more worried about our money to build big sanctuaries so that we can fund the programs so the kids can learn how to roller skate and skateboard and basketball and softball and football. We, we've become a social club. They said to Paul, you're crazy. What you're teaching is crazy. Isn't that what they say of Christians? You're all brainwashed. That's the same thing. When somebody says to me, oh, you're brainwashed, I say, yes, I am. My brain's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I am a new creation in Christ. I have the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. I'm on my way to heaven shouting victory. Hallelujah. I'm in the light, not in darkness anymore. Verse 25, he says, he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. I'll speak the words of truth and soberness, that which is in its right mind, clearly thought out, clearly preached, so there's no other way you can deduct anything else. The simplified gospel of salvation. And the sad part about it is, those that refuse on that day of judgment when they stand before God. God replays the rewind button on your life. And He hits the rewind button and shows you all the opportunities you had to accept Jesus as your Savior and you refuse. And he says, now, 
Let's look in the book. He opens the pages and he looks in the book of life and says, I am sorry your name is not there. And he gives permission for the angels to hand you over to Satan and the demons. And now they drag your soul into eternal hell fire forever and ever. Separated from God. Separated from loved ones. Separated from peace. Separated from joy. Separated from happiness. Se separated from tranquility. Then what are you going to say to God? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He's going to say, too late. Too late. They can mock and laugh now. They won't be laughing and mocking then. When the devil comes to claim their souls, they won't be laughing then. They won't be ridiculing then. That's sober. That's sober talking. That's sober thinking. Getting you to think soberly. Not all this snowflake, fluffy stuff. Make you feel good. Make you happy. Make you oh, feel so wonderful. That's not the kind of preaching we need in America. That's not the kind of preachers we need in New Bedford. We need preachers who will stand up and tell the truth no matter what. If they have to stand alone. Because we have a mandate. We're called by God. We're not appointed by any committee. We're not appointed or voted in. We have a divine mandate, a call from God that has called us to do this ministry. And by God, we'll do it to the last breath that comes out of my lips. You'll get the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That will carry you all of your Christian life. It will solidify you. It will make you like a rock. Solid. All this other stuff, when persecution comes, and it's coming, you will see those who are real Christians. You will see those who really want to serve God. You'll see those who really love God when persecution comes. What? If you're standing on all this fluff and feelings and emotions, you will run. That's why when we go on the mission field, people say, how can you go to that place? Aren't you afraid? When I kiss my wife goodbye, I say, honey, I love you. We're praying for a safe return, but if I do not come back, you serve God. If that's my appointed time to die, then so be it. When I was in India, lost 45 pounds in six weeks, riding on a motorcycle with dysentery every day, Suffered with a fever. The missions director said, you need to go home now. This was my third week. I said, my brother, let me tell you something. God sent me here. I'm going to finish here. If I drop dead behind that pulpit, I'm staying for my six weeks. Understand. Linda and I have suffered much for this ministry. You know what? A lot of times people don't appreciate what they that's before their face. That's why I don't play games. That's why I don't fluff things around.
People get offended over the little tiniest thing. But they don't, re they don't remember the years of, of goodness and love and patience that we had with them all that other time. I say, God bless you. He said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. But I speak forth the words of truth and soberness. I had someone tell me one time, you know you make me mad, but you make me think. You make me mad, but you make me think. Oh, yeah. I bet you some of you here have walked out of here saying, who does he think he is talking to? But understand, it's not me. Understand, it's my love for you to see you on the right path, making the right decision. And being, if I can put it this way, being in the bleachers, I can see a little bit more clearly down the road than you can in the situation you're in. And I say, don't go that way. Don't go down that road. Don't be heading in that direction. What happened? You were going down this road. You were getting closer to Jesus. You were coming to prayer. You were coming to uh, Bible study. You were coming Sunday morning. And now all of a sudden, sporadically, you come here, you come there, you come here, you come there. What happened? I will speak forth the words of truth and soberness because I love you. And if the day comes that I stop speaking the words of truth and soberness, I'll leave the ministry. Because I care too much for your soul to see you going down the road of destruction not say anything because I don't want to offend you. I don't want anyone pointing at me and saying, Pastor, why didn't you tell me? When you stand before God and all the, all the, all the gifts are handed out, all your rewards are handed out, and you have none, you say, Pastor, why didn't you tell me? Don't be mean. I'm going to tell you. Some of you will get mad. Some of you will leave the church. But I will always speak the words of truth and soberness. No matter if there's only one person sitting here. And if there's only one person sitting here, we can't afford to be here, so we'll close the church and go to my house. Soberness. Soberness. Do not envy the world. Do not envy the things of the world. Don't invent, don't envy what they do. Don't envy the churches that are like the world, doing what the world does. Don't envy those churches. If you envy those things, you will soon be drawn by those things. The one mistake that Lot made, I feel the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. One problem Lot made when he was given a choice by Abraham, his uncle, that he chose the watered plains rather than the mountain and hills because it was easier. But the sad part was that he pitched his tent on Sodom. And eventually, by pitching his tent towards Sodom, Later on, the scripture says he was at the gate of Sodom. You cannot pitch your tent towards Sodom and play with the things of the devil and think that you will not eventually be there. Thomas Brooks, great Puritan preacher, he said this, Those that play with Satan's, hook, play with Satan's bait shall soon be led by Satan's 
Those that play with Satan's bait shall soon be led by Satan's hook. You don't see the hook, do you? The fish don't see the hook. The worm is on the hook. So they go for the bait and you snap it back and you've got a hook. That's exactly what the devil does. He'll hook you through the things of this world. He'll hook you through money, making money. He'll hook you through any way he can. So start, you start to slack off here, slack off here, a little slacking here, a little folding of the hands, a little way back. And the Bible says poverty shall come upon you. That's not only physical poverty, that's spiritual poverty. Amen? Praise God. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad that you're sober-minded. I'm so glad you receive truth. Father, we pray for those listening by Facebook. We pray for their soul. God, we pray in the name of Jesus that they'll repent of their sins and get right with God. We pray that you will ask God's forgiveness for God to come and live within you by his Holy Spirit. Receive Christ now. Believe that the Father has raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. We pray for each one here tonight. Father, I ask your blessing upon them. Thank you for them coming. I pray, Lord, that you bless their going in, they're coming out, they're lying down, they're rising up. And I pray your peace be upon them in their home. Give them traveling mercies, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.